Welcome. My name is Karuna Tirumala. I work at the Northwest Tribal Epidemiology Center, helping to make tribal health data more accurate and accessible to Northwest tribes. This short video is focused on helping you interpret health data. It is the third in the series of videos designed to help staff from tribes and native serving organizations gather and use health data. To see the rest of the videos, visit the link shown below. Have you ever read a report at work and wondered, what do all these numbers actually mean? If so, you're definitely not alone. For many people, making sense of health data can seem intimidating at first. Fortunately though, in this area, a little knowledge goes a long way. In this video, I will share some basic information about ways health data is described and interpreted. I will also provide details about who you can contact if you have any question. We all know that being able to make sense of and use health data is important for so many reasons. To understand reports, prioritize funding, create useful policies and strategic plans, and to write meaningful grants. So let's use a few real world examples you might run across at work. Prevalence and incidence are two common terms in health reports and studies. Prevalence is the total number of people in a certain group experiencing something over a certain period of time. For example, in my community, 700 people regularly attended ceremonial sweats in 2018. In 2018, my community had 1,000 members. That means that the prevalence of people from my community who regularly attended ceremonial sweats in 2018 was 70%. Let's break that down further. I divided 700 regular attendees of ceremonial sweats in 2018 by 1,000 community members in 2018, which gives me 0 0.7 or 70%. An easy way to remember prevalence is to think prev all lens. It's all the people from a group in this example, from my community, who experienced something over a certain period of time, in this example, who regularly attended ceremonial sweats in 2018. Prevalence includes everyone. All the new folks who joined in and participated regularly in 2018, and all the folks who have been sweating for years and continued to regularly attend sweats in 2018. Incidents is the total number of people in a certain group experiencing something new over a certain period of time. For example, in my community, 200 new people regularly attended ceremonial sweats in 2018. My community had 1,000 members in 2018. That means that the incidence of people from my community who regularly attended ceremonial sweats in 2018 was 20%. Let's break that down further. I divided 200 new attendees in 2018 divided by 1,000 community members in 2018 equals 0 0.2 or 20%. An easy way to remember incidence is to think incidence. It is the people from a group, in this example from my community, who got into something new over a certain period of time. In this example, who started regularly attending ceremonial sweats in 2018. Incidence only explains the folks who newly joined in sweats and participated regularly. It does not count the folks who have been sweating for years and continued to regularly attend sweats during this time period. Often, in order to understand how we can best help our communities, we need to understand how certain diseases or conditions impact our community. To understand how much certain diseases or conditions impact our community over a certain period of time, we can use both prevalence and incidence. Let's talk about an example that you might see in your work. Imagine that you want to write a strategic plan for your department to create helpful priorities and goals and prioritize your funding and staff time you want to know which diseases impact your community the most. You remember that prevalence is the total number of people 
experiencing something over a certain period of time. You take action by contacting your clinic and requesting a report that includes the prevalence of the top five chronic diseases that impact tribal members who were patients over the past five years. The report you receive indicates that, compared to other diseases, diabetes impacts the highest number of tribal patients. You write in your strategic plan that the prevalence of diabetes among tribal members who were patients at the clinic was 15% during the time period 2017 to 2021. You know this number was calculated by taking the total number of all tribal patients with diabetes from 2017 to 2021, which was 150, divided by the total number of tribal patients from 2017 to 2021, which was 1,000. In this case, you know that the prevalence of diabetes, 15%, includes all the new patients who were tribal members who were diagnosed with diabetes from 2017 through 2021, and it includes all the tribal members who already had diabetes and were patients during 2017 through 2021. Now you know where to focus your energy and efforts. Something nice the clinic did when they sent you your report was that they also included a chart of prevalence of tribal patients with diabetes by year. As you can see, the prevalence of people experiencing diabetes has gradually increased year by year. This affirms for you that you need to take action now. Diabetes is something you'd like to address and you will include it in your department's strategic plan. Let's look at one more example that you might see in your work. Imagine that you and your team have worked really hard this past year in 2021 to encourage community members with diabetes to eat healthy foods and get more exercise. You created posters and handouts for your clinic and had a table at your tribal health fair and other events. Two of your key campaign messages were eat at least five fruits and vegetables a day and move your body at least 30 minutes a day. Now, after the campaign, you want to know how many people in your tribe with diabetes who were patients at the clinic actually saw improvements in their A1C levels. You know that A1C is a good data point to look at because A1C is a measure of someone's average blood sugar levels over a three month period. Suddenly, you remember the video you watched on prevalence and incidence. You know that incidence is when people from a certain group, tribal people with diabetes, got into something new or improved A1C levels over a certain period of time. So you take action. You ask the clinic to provide you with a report that has the incidence of patients who are tribal members with diabetes whose A1C levels improved in 2021. You know that this number will include the number of tribal members who were patients at the clinic with diabetes whose A1C levels improved in 2021 divided by the number of tribal members who were patients at the clinic with diabetes in 2021. You learn that the incidence of tribal members who were patients at the clinic with diabetes whose A1C levels improved in 2021 was 40%. That's amazing. It appears that your team's efforts likely contributed to this awesome success. After a moment though, you think, wait, maybe I should look at data from a couple of years to check and see if it was our efforts that made a difference. After all, you only did your five a day and move it campaign in 2021. So you ask the clinic for the incidence of tribal patients with diabetes whose A1C numbers improved in 2021, 2020, 2019, 2018, 2017, and 2016. Here is the incidence of tribal patients with diabetes whose A1C numbers improved in 2021, 2020, 2019, 2018, and 2017. You can see based on this chart, that it appears that your team's efforts likely drove this improvement in A1C levels for tribal patients with diabetes. You can share this information with your team and celebrate. You can also ask for permission to share the data with your community and your funders. Let's talk a bit about how to compare different groups' health data to one another. Proportions, rates, 
and rate ratios are commonly used to compare one group to another. A proportion is used to compare one group with a larger one to which it belongs. An example of a proportion is the proportion of the population who are native. Based on the 2010 census, 2,000 people in my county identified as AIAN. The total population of my county was 10,000. Therefore, the total proportion of people in my county who identified as native in 2010 was 20%. To get 20%, I divided the number of natives in my county in 2010, which is 2,000, by the total population of my county in 2010, which is 10,000. Rates measure an event in a certain group of people over a certain amount of time. For example, the chart below describes the rates of people who quit smoking in my state by race from 2006 through 2010. Note that NHW is an abbreviation for non-Hispanic white. As you can see, 60% of the people who stopped smoking in my state from 2006 through 2010 were native. You can also see that 20% of the people who stopped smoking in my state from 2006 through 2010 were white. To get the native rate, they divided the number of native people in my state who quit smoking from 2006 through 2010, divided by the total number of people in my state who quit smoking from 2006 through 2010. When they did this, they got 60%. A rate ratio is a tool that is helpful for comparing rates between groups. A rate ratio tells you how much more or less common a particular event that happened in one group is compared to another group over a certain period of time. For example, a rate ratio of five means that the event occurred at five times the rate in one group over another group over a certain period of time. What if your rate ratio is one? That means that the likelihood something would happen was equal for both groups over a certain period of time. In the chart below, the final column on the right has an example of a rate ratio. Remember, 60% of the people who stopped smoking in my state from 2006 through 2010 were native, and 20% of the people who stopped smoking in my state from 2006 through 2010 were white. To get the rate ratio, they divided 60% by 20%, or 0.6 by 0.2, which equals 3. That means that from 2006 through 2010, Native people were three times more likely to quit smoking in my state than white people. Here's a real-life example explaining how you can use rate ratios to get to the bottom of what's happening in your community. Imagine, one day, as you're working in your office, a tribal leader calls you. She is very concerned because she has heard from several people that they noticed that children living close to the mines on your reservation seem more likely to have asthma. She wants to know if this is true. You remember a video you watched about rate ratios. You remember that rate ratios tell you how much more or less common a particular event that has happened in one group is compared to another group over a certain period of time. You then decide to ask the clinic for data. You ask to see the rate of children who have asthma who lived by the mines on your reservation from 2015 through 2021. You also ask to see the rate of children who have asthma who did not live close to the mines from 2015 to 2021. As you can see, between 2015 and 2021, 30% of the children who lived by the mines had asthma. You also see that between 2015 and 2021, 70% of the children who did not live close to the mines had asthma. To get the rate ratio, you divide 30% by 70%, or 0.3 divided by 0.7, which equals 0.43, which is less than 1. You know that when a rate ratio is less than 1, it means that there is less risk for the group in question. You call your tribal leader back and tell her that based on the data you got from the clinic between 2015 and 2021, children living close to the mines actually had less risk of developing asthma than those living away from the mines, not more like she had worried. What if your rate ratio is one? That means that the risk or the likelihood that something would happen 
was equal for both groups. If it's less than one, as in the mining example, there was decreased risk or likelihood that something would happen for the group in question. If it's greater than one, as in this quitting smoking example, there was increased risk or likelihood that something would happen for the group in question. An important topic to learn about when it comes to interpreting health data is confidence intervals. But before we can talk about confidence intervals, we have to briefly talk about sampling. Sometimes we don't have the ability to get health data from every single person in a group of people. So we take a sample. We try to make sure that the data sample we take is representative of the whole group. Then we use the sample to attempt to understand the whole group. For instance, in this table about rates of those who quit smoking in my state from 2006 through 2010, the data they used to determine the rates was based on a sample. You can use confidence intervals to decide how confident you are that the data represents what is true. For example, if you look at the AIAN rate of 60%, it has two numbers in parentheses to the right of this rate. These two numbers in parentheses separated by a comma is called the confidence interval. Confidence intervals allow you to say that if you pull the sample from the population 100 times, 95 out of those 100 times, the estimate or the rate that you see will be contained somewhere in the confidence interval, the numbers in parentheses. What makes us even more certain in the estimate or the rate that you see is if the confidence interval is smaller. So a range of 50 to 70 is generally better than a range of 30 through 90. Why? there's less room for error. That being said, there are some cases where a rate gives you valuable insight, even if the confidence interval is large. Confidence intervals do not account for other sources of uncertainty in our sample data. For example, sometimes the way the sample was collected was biased, favoring one type of person over another. Or sometimes the data collected from the sample was entered incorrectly into the computer system. So we can't ever say with 100% certainty that the results we got from our sample really truly represents the larger group. That's just life. But looking at confidence intervals and understanding the way that data were collected can help. P-values, like confidence intervals, are a common way to decide if data results are due to something real happening in the populations rather than chance. A p-value means that the chance that the result you see are not representative of what we would find in the population. P-values range from zero to one. So do you want a small or a large p-value? Since we want our results to be representative of what you would generally find in the population, we want a small p-value. A small p-value, generally less than 0 0.05, makes us confident in our results. However, as with confidence intervals, there are no hard and fast rules. In certain cases, data can be useful even when the p-value is larger than 0.05. This video showed you some common ways to interpret health data. We learned about prevalence and incidence, with prevalence being all the people from a group who experience something over a certain period of time, and incidence being the people from a group who got into something new over a certain period of time. We learned about common ways to compare different groups, including proportions, rates, and rate ratios. We also discussed ways you can tell if data results most likely represent a whole group using confidence intervals and p-values. Thank you for listening in. Keep in mind, if you are ever struggling Consider connecting with the Northwest Tribal Epidemiology Center or the Tribal Epi Center that serves your region. Tribal Epi Centers are a great resource when it comes to health data. Not only can they help you with obtaining data, collecting your own data, analyzing and interpreting data, and translating your data into action, they can also help you understand your rights when it comes to health data because Tribal Epi Centers are uniquely able to respond to the needs of tribal and urban Indian communities. You can learn more about text at www.tribalepicenters.org.
If you are a member of a tribe in the Pacific Northwest and you need data services, contact the Northwest Tech by emailing npaihb at npaihb.org. If you are outside the Pacific Northwest, visit the Tribal Epicenter's website to find contact information for the tech director in your region. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this video. To watch the next video in the series, click the link shown to the left.